Over the last 11 sessions, we've explored a variety of tools for better unfolding the story of God that the Bible witnesses to. Now, we've seen that the Bible was designed not just to teach us a set of abstract religious rules, but to form in us Jesus' imagination for the world. But the truth is, when we open the Bible, we aren't always simply coming with open-ended curiosity for whatever God may have to say. Sometimes we come to the Bible with specific questions in mind. We come seeking God's mind or desires about a particular situation. We come to discern the will of God about a decision we're making. Uh, The good news we noted in the last session is that Jesus was fully aware that new questions would arise. This is precisely why he promised to send his followers the Holy Spirit. Under the guidance of the Spirit, the writers of the New Testament letters engage in an exercise of what you might think of as improvisational ethics. In conversation with the Spirit, they attempt to apply Jesus' revelation of God's character and desires to a variety of questions and situations that Jesus didn't directly address. Um, These questions that are considered in the New Testament include what qualifies a Christian for leadership, how Jesus' followers should think about marriage and singleness, and what should be done if a Christian denied their faith under persecution. But one question more than any other question dominated first century conversation— Uh, Christianity had originally started as a branch of Judaism. However, as the story of Jesus began to spread across the world, more and more non-Jews, also called Gentiles, uh, joined the Christian community. Uh, These Gentiles came to Jesus with their own distinctive cultures and customs and preferences. Now, over time, a debate began to heat up over to what extent all of these newcomers needed to adopt the cultural and religious practices of Judaism in order to be full Christians. This debate had a whole variety of specific flashpoints in the first century. Uh, One flashpoint was whether it was necessary to keep Jewish holidays and Sabbath laws. Another major site of conflict was the dinner table. Jewish tradition held certain foods to be unclean or off-limits. This made it difficult for Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians to eat together without somebody taking offense. And no flashpoint ran hotter than that of the Gentile relationship to circumcision, the key sign of Jewish covenant and identity that many in history had died to preserve. Now, lucky for us, there are a couple of places in the New Testament where the debate around these kinds of questions surfaces, and we get a chance to see how the church went about figuring out what God truly desired. One notable story of discernment comes from Acts chapter 15. Here, the church calls together a group of leaders for a gathering later known as the Jerusalem Council, The purpose of this council was to consider the question of whether Gentiles should be required to be circumcised in order to be accepted as full and equal members of the Christian community. Uh, There are a number of things that can be observed about the way these first Christians undertook the process of discerning God's will. Uh, The first thing to notice in the story is that nobody appears to question whether or not there is authority present to make a judgment on this matter. In Matthew 16, 19, the very first time the church is mentioned in the New Testament, Jesus had said this, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. 
This strange language of fastening and loosening was common Jewish language that was used to discuss the interpretation of scripture. To fasten something was to require it or forbid it. To loosen is to permit. This authority of interpreting God's desires and holding people accountable to them is clearly given here by Jesus to the church, the community of his followers. In other words, important matters of judgment weren't simply left to private individuals following their own consciences. But of course, it's not immediately obvious who or what counts as the authoritative church. How many Jesus followers have to agree, and which ones? The truth is, the New Testament gives us no explicit answer to this question. But we might at least learn something about how Jesus' first disciples thought about this uh, by considering who is in the room when they make this monumental decision for the church. Uh, The group that's drawn together to discern in Acts 15 is not a random sampling of all professing Christians who are alive at the moment. They are apostles and elders, uh, people who know Jesus' story best and people who are recognized for their spiritual maturity. This suggests that discernment is not the same thing as democratic process. The ultimate goal of discernment is not to know the will of the human majority, but to know the will of God. And when it comes to discerning God's will, specific equipment is required. The qualifications for discernment are different than those for normal leadership out in the world. What qualifies a person for spiritual discernment is not a position or a title or an educational degree. What qualifies a person is formation in the story of Jesus. Practice listening for God. Commitment to submitting to God and others. And evidence of the mature fruit of the Spirit. Only people who are thoroughly formed in these postures are prepared for the challenging work of high-stakes discernment. This is so crucial for us to recognize because the practices we are engaging in right now, are already equipping us, or not, to be effective discerners in the future when urgent questions arise. The most important part of discernment is the work of spiritual formation that happens well in advance of any specific discernment process. It's also notable that the people the church drew together were not just people who already agreed on some predetermined outcome. A group that shares the same perspective from the outset is more prone to hearing their own thoughts echo back to them as the voice of God. With diverse groups, this is far less likely. The group discerning in Acts 15 includes James, the brother of Jesus, who is famous for his piety and his commitment to the Jewish law. It also includes Paul, a friend of the Gentiles, and an outspoken advocate for a law-free existence. It even includes Peter, who could be swayed either way, depending on who was in the room. When the group gathers together, the first thing they do is consider where and how they believe they've seen God's Spirit moving. Individuals share stories of specific experiences they had where they believed they'd heard the voice of God speaking or directing. Even coming from as respected a person as Peter, the leader of Jesus' disciples, stories of personal encounter with the Spirit were not considered the final word on the question of God's desires. But these stories were taken very seriously and were given real weight in the deliberation. The likelihood that God was truly speaking in any of these encounters grew as more and more people with diverse interests and investments gave testimony to hearing the Spirit summon them all in the same direction. These personal experiences with God's voice 
we're also tested for the fruit that signals the Spirit's involvement. In other words, it was assumed that they were recognizable markers that accompany the Spirit's presence. Uh, Peter who a few chapters earlier in Acts 10 had had a striking personal encounter with the Spirit that persuaded him God was accepting the Gentiles without circumcision, uh, reminds people of his story, and he notes that God purified their deepest thoughts and desires through faith. In other words, Peter suggests that the transformation of hearts and lives should be taken as evidence that the Spirit really has been at work here. But of course, as we noted in the last session, in our exploration of the Spirit's role, all senses of the Spirit's guiding must be ultimately measured by the revelation of God in Jesus and in Scripture. The story of God's activity in the world may take unexpected turns, but the character and the intentions of God do not ever change. The mission of God continues as it has since the beginning. So the church turns to the Bible in Acts 15 to determine if their sense of the Spirit's activity aligns with other words God has spoken in the past and with the trajectory of the Bible's overall storyline. In turning to the Bible, the council gathered in Acts 15 didn't just turn to a few select verses they deemed to be relevant. Instead, they considered carefully the Bible's whole testimony. On the one hand, some places like Genesis seem to make it quite clear that circumcision was necessary for everyone. But on the other hand, we've noted before that what matters is not just what one verse says, but how that one truth relates to other biblical truths. And in this case, it's actually James, the man who is famed for his commitment to Scripture, who points out that what Peter and Paul and Barnabas and others have sensed the Spirit is doing perfectly aligns with what the prophet Amos noted had always been God's intention. Amos observed that God's purpose in choosing and in covenanting with Israel was always to draw the rest of humanity toward God. The council determines that the sense Peter, Paul, and others had from the Spirit that circumcision is not necessary for Gentiles is in fact in line with the trajectory of the Bible as a whole and with its larger storyline of God pursuing all the nations. With this established biblically, they then feel free to make a tentative judgment. They should make it as easy as possible for Gentiles to come to faith, which means that circumcision should not be mandated. However, they do decide to make a few smaller requirements that will allow Jews and Gentiles to eat and fellowship together without causing unnecessary offense to each other. When the council releases its judgment, they introduce it with a declaration, it seems good to the Spirit and to us. Uh, This indicates their conviction that their decision isn't just emerging from their own common sense or from a practical compromise of the group. It's actually coming from a genuine sense of what God is saying and doing. This judgment they make then enters into the stream of the Christian tradition itself. Time and experience are the ultimate test of discernment. If over time the decision that results in the multiplication of people who are growing to look more and more like Jesus, then there's a good chance they've heard the Spirit right. If, however, the result does not manifest the Spirit's fruit, there may be good reason to go back and reevaluate what they thought they heard. In the case of Acts 15, the Spirit moves in such a way that a diverse group of people come to an almost miraculous agreement. However, many people observe with no small amount of frustration that things don't always work out this way. Sometimes a group of sincere Christians may gather to discern God's will and might not be able to arrive in an agreement 
about what exactly God is saying. So, what then? Uh, Luckily, we have stories like this in the Bible as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Romans 14 and 15 are both passages that address the ongoing debate over what it's permissible to eat and what sacred days need to be kept. Uh, Most meat available in the first century marketplace had first been sacrificed in a temple to some Roman god before making its way for sale. So one pressing question became whether or not Christians could eat that meat without essentially participating in idolatry. No agreement on this question had been reached in the church. In 1 Corinthians 8.4, Paul states his opinion plainly. He says, We know that a false god isn't anything in this world, and that there is no god except for the one god. In other words, as far as Paul is concerned, if you know other gods aren't real, then one piece of meat is just as good as another. But it's also clear there are people in the church who don't feel the same, who experience the presence of that idol as a a real and spiritually threatening thing. So Paul lays out a series of principles for how to live in Christian disagreement. He says in verse 9, Be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. In other words, the ultimate question for a Jesus follower is not what they have a right to do. What is relevant to Christian behavior is not only what's spiritually permissible in and of itself, but how your actions affect other people. In Romans 15, Paul makes the basis of this argument plain. He says, Each of us should please our neighbors for their good in order to build them up. Christ didn't please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insulted you fell on me. For Christians, all decisions are measured by the character of Christ. And according to Paul, the character that Christ demonstrated did not involve a forceful assertion of personal rights, however justified they might be. Instead, Christ considered the needs, the interests, the well-being, even the reputations of other people ahead of his own. This is the example set by Jesus not only with respect to his friends, but also with respect to his opponents. This, therefore, is the standard for Jesus-shaped disagreement. For the rest of the world, back in the first century and especially today in the 21st, the only question that matters is, is this permissible? But for Christians, the real question is, how do I build other people up for their good? How do I guard the good work that God is doing in them? For Paul, who's viewing the world with an imagination shaped by Jesus, to disagree as Christians means to consider ourselves what our opponent needs to practice their faith with integrity and conviction. In Romans 14.4, Paul makes an argument that might be surprising to most people. He argues that if someone thinks that something is wrong, then it is wrong for them to do. Meat might just be meat, but if someone is intimidated by Paul into eating against their conscience, they are doing something wrong. In 1 Corinthians 8, 11 and 12, Paul goes even further. If you pressure someone to act against their conscience, he says, you sin against them and against Christ. Your knowledge, even if it's true and right knowledge, has become destructive to others. How can this be, you might ask? Well, because what matters for Christians isn't just the objective nature of an action, but how that action orients us toward God. What matters for a Christian is submission to Christ, to prioritize something else over submission to God's will. God's will. 
or to pressure someone else to do so can be profoundly damaging. Paul says, again, viewing the world with the imagination of Jesus, if food causes the downfall of my brother or sister, I won't eat meat ever again. This is what an ethic of love looks like in action. Paul has very straightforward advice for Jesus' followers who are living with disagreement. He says to the Christians in Rome, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. He welcomed you when you were imperfect, broken, and wrong about so many things. Uh, Furthermore, Paul points out, uh, remember whose acceptance really matters. Uh, Who are you to judge someone else's servants? They stand or fall before their own Lord, and they will stand because the Lord has the power to make them stand. God can be trusted to make the just judgments that are required. And God's mercy for all of us is thankfully much greater than ours often is for each other. Real discernment is a challenging process that requires heavy doses of humility, patience, and grace. No matter how hard we try, both we and others will get it wrong sometimes. Uh, We will have to keep on repenting and turning. Uh, But are are there any safeguards at all to make sure we don't, in our listening, stumble too far off the tracks? Well, one of Jesus' most famous stories is that of the Good Samaritan. A traveler on a journey is beat up and lying half dead in a ditch. A series of religious people pass him by without stopping to help. It's ultimately a Samaritan, a member of a group that was hated by the Jews for all of the things they got wrong about Scripture and God, who who stops to bind this man's wounds. Many people know this story, but few people realize that Jesus told this particular story in the context of a conversation he was having with a religious expert about how the Bible should be understood. Uh, The religious expert that Jesus was talking to would have understood that the reason the religious people were passing by this wounded man was not that they were cruel or cold-hearted or jerks, but because they had interpreted the Bible in a way that made this man seem untouchable. And Jesus' story about the Samaritan doesn't tell us how to guarantee we will interpret the Bible right. But what it does offer us is one important test for where we might be getting it wrong. Any reading of God's word that requires us to walk away from the man lying broken in the ditch has missed the message somewhere, according to Jesus. God's will is life and healing, and God's commandment is love. For all that we don't know, that's enough place to start. And in the end, God's grace is big enough to save all followers of Jesus, even those who've fallen forward a bit, seeking after the pleasure of God.